Hey everybody and welcome back to another edition of James Bond Revisited and this week we're doing something a little bit different. We're counting down the top 10 greatest James Bond villains of all time and yes I am including henchmen and henchwomen so I apologize if I've missed your favorite but here are my top 10. Coming in at number 10 is Le Chiffre and of course I'm talking about Mads Mikkelsen's performance as Le Chiffre as in point of fact due to a complicated legal rights situation Mikkelsen was not the first actor to play the part. Peter Lorre actually played him in a CBS Climax Theater TV version of the book, while Orson Welles played him in the big budget 007 spoof version of Casino Royale, which strangely enough is actually my most popular James Bond revisited video ever. Martin Campbell directed the performances of no less than three of my top 10 Bond villains, and I think what makes his villains so good is how grounded he keeps them, while also making them a credible physical threat to Bond. Mickelson has a great look with the scar and the bleeding tear duct, but there's a humanity to him in that he's desperate. When Bond cleans him out of the tables, he knows he's marked for death and his desperate act against Bond where he nearly destroys his testicles with a carpet beater is one of the most cringe inducing moments of the franchise and I have to mention straight out of Ian Fleming. I don't think any guy went to see Casino Royale and didn't cross their legs in this sequence. It is nerve wracking. No! No! To the right! To the right! To the right! You are a funny man Mr. Bond. Number 9 is going to be a very controversial choice, Grace Jones's Mayday. Now hear me out. She's one of, I think, a recurring motif in this video, hench people that overshadow the main villain. Now this may sound like sacrilege, as I know people love Christopher Walken as Max Zorn, but I never found that character to be all that interesting. He's basically just an 80s ripoff of Goldfinger, except instead of gold, you've got microchips. Yet Mayday is played by Grace Jones with something different. Now, Roger Moore always had this kind of jocular, buddy-buddy kind of relationship with everybody on set, you know, and it seemed like everybody really liked him, but one of the few people he didn't get along with was Grace Jones. In fact, apparently they despised each other off screen, but that kind of leads to some intriguing energy between the two, especially when they have sex in a really uncomfortable moment. Jones also strikes a really sympathetic note, especially towards the end when she's been betrayed by Zoran and actually becomes kind of a good guy. And Moore is playing opposite her in the final act, doing something kind of different for Roger Moore. He's acting. I love Roger Moore, but you know, heavy lifting in terms of drama isn't necessarily really his thing in the James Bond movies. He kind of plays it cool and easygoing. But you know, at the end of View to a Kill, he really has to kind of evoke some sympathy and it's pretty interesting. Also, she looks really cool. I mean, I love that hair, the outfits, it's really neat. Number 8, another henchman, but man, one of the best. Richard Keel's jaws made for an unforgettable sight. 7 foot 2 with a mouthful of steel teeth. A lot of kids are probably afraid of him, but I wanted to be Jaws' best friend. The fight between Bond and Keel on the train in Spy Who Loved Me is a classic, and everyone knew they had such a good thing going with Richard Keel, they let him live. Sadly, the impact of the character was ruined when he became essentially Wile E. Coyote to James Bond's Roadrunner in Moonraker, even becoming a good guy at the end with a dopey love interest to boot. They even let him talk. Actually, I have to say, Richard Keel's got a pretty good voice. Well, here's to us. Coming in at number seven, Goldfinger, the one who started it all. Oric Goldfinger, as played by Gert Frobe, was an imposing sight. With his German accent, which was actually dubbed because Gert Frobe's German accent was actually too heavy for the role, and a Humpty Dumpty look, Goldfinger was the first James Bond villain that was larger than life, right down to his obsession with gold. This is gold, Mr. Bond. All my life I've been in love with its color, its brilliance, its divine heaviness. Some of the dialogue here is unbelievable and I always get a kick out of his death scene. Also, he had a really cool henchman of his own, Oddjob, but this is the one time the henchman didn't overshadow the villain. Do you expect me to talk? No, Mr. Bond, I expect you to die. Number six, another hench person, but man, a really hot one. Xenia on a top, as played by Famke Jansen. Wow. I mean, I don't think nowadays you'd be able to do a PG-13 James Bond movie where the henchwoman orgasms when she kills people with her thighs. I mean, it's just unbelievable. But Famke Jansen is so over the top and great in this role. I mean, look at her. She's absolutely gorgeous. And you can tell that Pierce Brosnan or James Bond, I guess, really wants to, you know, have sex with her throughout most of the movie, even if she's evil. Who can blame him? But it's a really good part. I think that Jansen's great in it. I can see why she was one of the few 
few women to star in James Bond movies that actually kind of escaped the curse of the Bond girls because she went on to have a really good career. Because the fact is, she's actually a really, really solid actress. She's terrific in this role, and some of the dialogue and the acting is just terrific. I think Xenia on the top is just an absolute scene stealer. Wait for your turn. Coming in at number five. This is interesting because this is the first shadow James Bond character on my list. Red Grant as played by Robert Shaw in From Russia With Love. Now, he's a really physically imposing guy with his bleach blonde hair and his physical build, which makes him pretty much the exact, you know, kind of clone in some ways of Sean Connery because they're built in almost exactly the same way. And he's kind of like Bond in a lot of ways. He's just as smart as he is. He's just as physically capable, but he has no morality at all. He works for Spectre and he's as invaluable to them as James Bond is to MI6. At the end of the movie, when they fight on the Orient Express, it's a real nail biter because they both seem like they're kicking the shit out of each other, and it's so good. I think Robert Shaw is such a good actor and probably could have played James Bond if you watch him when he's pretending to be Colonel Nash. He's all smooth and sophisticated. He really could have played the part, but man, does he ever make for a good villain. I get a kick out of watching the great James Bond. I know what a bloody fool he's been making of himself. We're pros, Mr. Bond. Coming in at number four, Javier Bardem Silva, who I talked about a couple weeks ago in my James Bond Revisited on Skyfall. Like Red Grant, he's another shadow James Bond. He was a secret agent with a great relationship with Judy Dench's M, but he was betrayed and left physically disfigured after being tortured by the Chinese, and now he wants revenge. Bond has been betrayed several times, but always kind of shrugs it off because he's honor bound. Silva is not and wants revenge. And the ending of this movie is really powerful because you have Javier Bardem at the top of his game, acting opposite Judi Dench and Daniel Craig, neither of whom are slouches. Plus they've got an amazing director, Sam Mendes. It's emotional, it's operatic. I think that he is terrific in this movie. You see what comes of all this running around, Mr. Bond? All this jumping and fighting. It's exhausting. Coming in at number three, one of my favorite modern James Bond villains, and one that also might be a little bit controversial on this list, Robert Davi as Franz Sanchez in License to Kill. Now, what I really like about this part is that in the 80s, you see drug dealing villains were kind of all the rage, but they were always played as psychotic. Sanchez, while definitely a sadist, as you can see by his introduction where he whips Lupe, is probably not psychotic. You see, the thing that's interesting about him is that you can really see that the character inspires loyalty among his men, specifically Benicio Del Toro's Dario, who I think is actually quite a good hench person in this movie. He looks like a kid, and in fact, Del Toro was only about 21 when it was made, but you can really tell that he loves Sanchez and looks up to him like a big brother or a father, and Sanchez is very loyal to him. He doesn't want to give him up, and his life is more important to him than money. That's the thing about Sanchez. Loyalty is the most important thing to him above all things and it's pretty amazing. There's a scene where Dario is being shredded at the end by Pam Bouvier and he's just screaming out Sanchez over and over and over again because he wants his friend or his mentor to come and save him, but it doesn't happen. And I almost kind of felt bad for Sanchez because you can tell he actually, in a weird way, wants to be friends with James Bond because when he thinks that Bond's a mercenary, he kind of sees himself in it and wants to build him up to be kind of like the number two man in his corporation. But of course, he's evil, he's a drug dealer, he's gotta die. And Robert Davi really gave this performance his all because I think Davi, in some ways wanted to be a leading man and in fact would star in a lot of movies after this. It's funny, John Glenn said that in the audition for Talisa Soto, he had Robert Davi acting as James Bond and he said, you know what, he wasn't half bad. Coming in at number two, Sean Bean as 006 in Goldeneye. Now the interesting thing about Sean Bean was that he was one of the finalists to actually take over the role and could have easily played James Bond. But I think what made him cool as 006 is that he really does feel kind of like the other side of a coin for James Bond. He's just one rank ahead of him, but unlike Bond, he doesn't have that unassailable loyalty to the British Empire. In fact, his family being Lien's Cossacks were betrayed by the government and he wants revenge. He also wants revenge against Bond because by changing the detonator he ended up with a scar. There's also kind of a warmness between them, which I think is really cool. And their fight scene at the end is unbelievable because these are two guys that are clearly in their physical prime and just equally trained. It's so good. And I remember getting really excited for Pierce Brosnan as James Bond after the scene because he was so good in the fight scenes. Unfortunately, the James Bond movies that followed with Pierce Brosnan kind of devolved into just generic shoot 'em ups, which is too bad. In some ways, the Daniel Craig James Bond movies delivered on the promise of Goldeneye. Why can't you just be a good boy and die? You first. 
And coming in at number one, who else could it be but Ernst Stavro Blofeld? Now, I'll give you this. Not every actor that played Ernst Stavro Blofeld is good. When I'm talking about the best James Bond villains, I'm really talking about the early Blofeld. You know, the guy in the shadows with the signet ring and the cat in For Marshall With Love and Thunderball, and then Donald Pleasance in You Only Live Twice. I mean, he really unnerved me as a kid with his bald head and his scar. You look in his eyes, he never blinks once, and that Nero jacket is very creepy. I think he was terrific, and I also really like Telly Savalas in kind of a different take on the role in Honor Majesty's Secret Service. He's still bald, he still wears a narrow jacket, but he doesn't have the scar and he's a little bit more charismatic and a little bit more physically capable. He's still got the cat, but you actually don't see him holding the cat too much because I don't think the cat actually liked Telly Savalas or vice versa. However, the person that they got to play Blofeld afterwards in Diamonds Are Forever, Charles Gray, was an absolute disaster. Now, I like Charles Gray as an actor. He's fun in a kind of a camp way in Rocky Horror Picture Show, but he also plays Blofeld like he's in Rocky Horror Picture Picture Show. It's such a camp performance that doesn't suit the movie at all. It's just terrible, and I think he was awful in the role. Now, of course, Blofeld did come back in a fashion in For Your Eyes Only, where Roger Moore drops him down a smokestack, but, you know, it's kind of a goofy, jokey scene that they just did as a dig at Kevin McClory. And in fact, Kevin McClory would have his revenge two years later when he would come out with Never Snever Again, which would have Blofeld as played by Max von Sydow. Although I have to say, even though he's a great actor, doesn't make much of an impact as Blofeld. In fact, Klaus Maria Brandauer is much better in that as the other villain. Also, Barbara Carrera is really good in that. But, you know, I didn't really put any James Bond villains from Never Never Again on this list because they're not official James Bond villains. And of course, there's Christoph Waltz as Blofeld, Inspector. And I have to say, as a huge fan of Blofeld, I was very disappointed in his performance because Christoph Waltz is just too typical for that role. In fact, somebody suggested on my James Bond Revisited video on Spectre that they should have put Dave Bautista as Blofeld. And I think that kind of would have been amazing. I mean, he was great as Hicks, the henchman, but man, if you watch Dave Bautista in some of his other movies like Blade Runner, you really kind of get the sense that he's an amazing actor. And man, he would have been so good as the villain in this movie. He would have really delivered something and they just didn't allow him. They just cast him as a henchman because I think the casting choices in this one were a little bit narrow. But you know what? They've recast Blofeld before. They could recast him again. So I don't know, maybe give him a chance if it doesn't work out in No Time to Die, which of course features the return of Christoph Waltz's Blofeld in what I assume is actually going to be kind of a small role. Anyway, those are my top 10 favorite James Bond villains. I'm sure that a lot of you have different opinions than me. There were some that almost made the list but didn't quite make it. Of course, there was Dr. No, as played by Joseph Wiseman, but his role in the film is just too small for him to make the list. I also came very close to putting Christopher Lee on this for Francisco Scaramanga, but I just never liked his kind of scheme with the Solex agitator. It felt tacked on. And he's almost too sympathetic, and Bond is such an asshole in that movie. It's the only James Bond movie where I wanted the villain to win. Most of the Pierce Brosnan Bond villains are all kind of terrible and the probably the worst James Bond villains of all time even though it's one of my favorite James Bond movies ever strangely enough is The Living Daylights with Yaron Krabbe as Koskoff and Joe Don Baker as Whitaker I mean these guys are terrible but man what a great movie so join us next time here on James Bond Revisited well we'll have another list for you but I'm not going to tell you what it is yet you'll have to tune in next week and if you like this kind of content make sure to click on the bell to receive notifications for all of our latest videos we're an independent company and we appreciate all of your support